All right, so if you remember from Monday, we spent most of Monday talking about you know, what it means to be an acid and a base based upon our Bronsted-Lowry definitions. Remember, acids were substances that gave away hydrogen ions and bases were substances that took hydrogen ions. Well, now that we've kind of established what acids and bases are, we can start to put them into different categories. And in particular, the categories that we are going to put them in are um, identifiers of strength. And the strength of an acid or a base is based upon a concept known as ionization strength or extent of ionization. What we mean by this is How well does the molecule break apart into ions? That's really the question here. Now, if you remember from your lab where we did that electrical conductivity, acids and bases were capable of breaking down into ions. They are molecular compounds for the most part. Um, uh, certain hydroxide salts um, are actually ionic. But for acids, most acids are molecular compounds that are capable of breaking apart into ions based upon certain situations. What makes an acid strong or weak is based upon how well it breaks apart into those ions. And so we identify a strong acid as one that ionizes completely. So if I look at the chemical equation for what happens to a strong acid like HCl, we will see that this reaction is a one-way street. all of the HCl turns into hydronium ion, H3O+, and chloride ion. As a result, strong acids would be classified as strong electrolytes. Weak acids, on the other hand, don't do the same thing. Weak acids will ionize to a small extent. And so let's take a common example of a weak acid, acetic acid. When it reacts with water, it will form hydronium and acetate ions. There's a big difference between this equation and the top equation. And that is that this reaction is not one way, but two way. What happens in weak acids and in weak bases for that matter, is that the reaction that forms the ions is reversible. And so as some of the acetic acid breaks apart into hydronium ion and acetate ion, there will be hydronium ion and acetate ion that recombine to form acetic acid and water again. So the net result Ions are present, but in lower amounts, this is what we would call a weak electrolyte.
This is the same kind of phenomenon that happens in a lot of weak bases. So take, for example, ammonia, NH3. When ammonia reacts with water, it will form the ammonium ion, NH4+, plus, in the hydroxide ion, OH-. Minus. But that reaction is reversible as well. And so really that's the difference between strong and weak as far as acids and bases are concerned. Strong acids and strong bases are gonna have a one-way street in their chemical reactions. All of the molecules are gonna turn into ions. Net result, we've got tons of ions present. We have a solution that is very, very good at conducting electricity. Weak acids and weak bases are going to be characterized by the reversibility of their reactions. And as a result of that reversibility, we have fewer ions present, which means we have a solution that is capable of conducting electricity, but to a much lesser degree. And as a result, we get a weak electrolyte that comes from that. So if you think back to the, that experiment that you did a couple of weeks ago, when it comes to acids and bases, that's the reason why we saw the differences between some kinds of acids behaving one way and other kinds of acids behaving a different way. Here it is again, kind of a picture form. So in this glass rod, um, we are bubbling in hydrogen chloride gas into the water. As it bubbles into the water, what we'll find is that the hydrogen chloride gas reacts with the water to make hydrogen chloride, or excuse me, hydronium ion and the chloride ion. All of these molecules here turn into ions here. We end up getting a very strong electrolyte solution as a result. When it comes to strong acids, there are in fact seven. There are seven and really only seven acids that are common and strong. There are other strong acids that exist, but they're far more rare, far more less likely that you'll actually see them. The seven strong acids are these, hydrochloric, hydrobromic, hydroiodic. Those are all your binary strong acids, those three halogenated um, acids. The others, the ternary acids that are strong, you've got nitric acid, you've got chloric acid, you've got perchloric acid, and you've got sulfuric acid. Now notice that Of these acids, those three are the probably even more common of them. We've, we've experienced, we've used those three acids at different points in time in the lab this semester. The other one's a little bit less common, um, especially when you consider that on the whole, the hydrochloric, the nitric, the sulfuric acid, easier to come by you get the same kinds of results. Um, and so we don't tend to see the other ones as often either. On the base half of the diagram, we know that strong bases are strong electrolytes as well. Now, most of our bases that are strong come in a crystalline form meaning that they are solids outside of water and dissolve into ions inside of water. So in this case, we've got uh, sodium hydroxide, lye. Um, the crystalline structure of sodium hydroxide 
looks like this. And so you can see we've got this very ordered array of sodium ions and hydroxide ions um, kind of meshed together here. When they go into the water, the water starts to pull them apart. And what we'll end up with are sodium ions in isolation, hydroxide ions in isolation, and water molecules kind of separating them and being attracted to them as they pull them apart. So again, we see a complete ionization here, meaning, again, the ticket is one way. All the sodium hydroxide solid turns into sodium ions and hydroxide ions. There is no backward path. There is no return trip. Your common strong bases um, fall mostly into the categories of your group one, that is your alkali metal hydroxides, and your group two alkaline earth metal hydroxides. So lithium hydroxide, sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide. It's not listed here, but if you get your hands on rubidium hydroxide or cesium hydroxide, they'd apply as well. Um, magnesium hydroxide, calcium hydroxide, barium hydroxide, they, they all fall into this category as well. One important note about those last three you saw this to a certain extent in lab last week. Calcium hydroxide does not dissolve very well in water. But when it does dissolve, it does dissolve in that one way kind of fashion. We get complete ionization that takes place. And so that's where we have to kind of be careful with these. Water solubility is going to be difficult, especially in those alkaline earth metal compounds. But when we do get it to dissolve, however we get it to dissolve, the result is a strong base, a complete ionization of those particles into ions. And the other thing that we take away from these in particular is that those two hydroxides in the chemical formula end up giving us two hydroxides in the solution. So in some ways per molecule, those substances are more effective as bases because they're gonna get a larger proportion, a larger percent of hydroxides coming into the water. So when it comes to weak, weak acids and weak bases are strong, or excuse me, are weak electrolytes. Uh, you can see the two examples that I gave um, previously. Here we have acetic acid and here we have ammonia. And in both cases, look at the arrows in that chemical equation. That double headed arrow or that series of two arrows pointing in opposite directions indicates a reaction that is reversible. Now, next week, we'll talk more about reversible reactions when we talk about chemical equilibrium. But the reversibility of these reactions end up impacting overall because what we'll see is that if I look closely, there's one ionization. There's another one in here I'm trying to find. Uh, maybe this one. Um, there's a second one. 
but the majority of the molecules in here did not ionize. Stayed in their molecular form. And this is really common for strong, or excuse me, for, uh, for weak acids. Same thing for weak bases. You'll notice that we had that one. We had a pair of ionizations here. But for the most part, the ammonia stayed in its molecular form. Again, in weak bases and in weak acids, that's what we're going to find. We're going to find that the majority of the substances stay together, and only a few of them actually go into forming ions. Now, because there are ions present, each of these solutions will conduct electricity. However, their ability to conduct electricity will be completely severely hampered by the fact that there are not many ions there. Here are some common weak acids. So acetic acid, for example. Acetic acid is found in vinegar. It is the active ingredient in vinegar. It's also found in um, things like uh, fermented beverages that have gone bad. So if you leave wine out, if you open wine and you leave it out for too long, it turns sour. That is the result of the oxidation of the ethanol turning into acetic acid. Carbonic acid. Um, it's found in sodas. We already talked about that particular example um, with uh, the, the, the bottle of soda in Henry's Law. Uh, carbonic acid is also found in some form in your blood. Um, your blood actually is a combination of a number of different factors uh, to help regulate a certain type of body pH. And carbonic acid is part of that. Citric acid, citric acids are found in a lot of fruits. They're also found in certain types of sodas, especially those that um, have a, a citrus kind of uh, flavor to them. Hydrofluoric acid is actually, even though it's a weak acid, it is a very reactive acid. Um, it is um, very reactive with uh, silicates. Um, and so for that reason, hydrochloric acid has to be stored in bottles that are not made out of glass because otherwise it'll eat through the glass. Um, and so in some ways we use that uh, for things like etching of glasses um, and for some semiconductor manufacturing processes. Hypochlorous acid. Um, that is the acidic form of sodium hypochlorite. Sodium hypochlorite, you know better as bleach. Um, hypochlorous acid is an acidified form that can be used for sanitary purposes in water supplies. So we use it to regulate the pH of the water while also disinfecting it. Lactic acid um, and lactose found in uh, milk Oleic acid and maltose found in fruit. Oxalic acid is found in a number of places, um, as is phosphoric acid and tartaric acid as well. So um, these are all real common weak acids, things that you would usually find in commercial products, food products, um, and so on. On the base side, there are fewer common weak bases, and that's mainly because a lot of weak bases that we find are just stuff that um, are usually organic kind of base samples. Uh, some of the more common ones, ammonia. Ammonia, we know we, we find it in a number of household cleaners. Uh, calcium carbonate, um, Tums, and acids. Um, use calcium carbonate as their primary means of uh, reacting with excess stomach acid. You also find calcium carbonate in a number of minerals. Calcium carbonate um, 
uh, can also be found in other things like chalk um, because of its mineral nature and because of its soft nature as a rock. Um, it's one of the reasons why it was used that way for, so, for quite some time. Calcium hypochlorite, um, sometimes known as HTH. Um, this is a common disinfecting agent used for large scale um, purification of things like swimming pools. So um, if you have a pool at your house or even a hot tub, um, HTH is often used for killing bacteria. Um, calcium hypochlorite is a good uh, use for that. Um, these other ones probably don't run into too much uh, unless you eat a whole lot of pickled herring. Uh, you're not going to run into too much methylamine, at least in that way. Um, it's found in the, the salt water solution uh, for uh, uh, pickled herring. Um, the trimethylamine, that is a product that is found as part of the decay process for fish in particular. Um, and so it's responsible for that, that particular smell. All right, any questions about strong acids, strong bases versus weak acids, weak bases? All right, if you're following along in the PowerPoint, I'm going to jump all the way to the end here. We're going to skip over this part in the middle just for a minute. I want to actually take us to the end here. So we're going to go to 13.6 buffered solutions next. It's slide number 38. Now, why do I want to jump ahead here? Well, the real reason is your lab today or tomorrow. Now, if you had lab yesterday, hopefully uh, Mr. Miller kind of put this into context for you, a little bit of perspective. If not, let's see if we can try to add to what you saw in lab. So we talked about the idea of acids and bases, and you saw a little bit last week about the idea of pH, the pH scale. Well, a buffer system is when we have two things in solution at the same time. And those two things are a weak acid and what we know as its conjugate base. Now, what is a conjugate base? A conjugate base would be, if we look at those acid equations, the, we talked about the idea of matched pairs. The conjugate base is the matched pair of that weak acid. So if we think about carbonic acid for a second here, When carbonic acid reacts with water, it's going to make hydronium ion and the bicarbonate ion. <clears throat> now, in Monday's lecture, we talked about the idea of matched pairs, meaning there are two substances two pairs of substances that differ from each other by only plus or minus one H plus ion. Now on Monday, we talked about the idea of we could identify the carbonic acid as an acid. We could identify the water as a base. Well, in these reversible reactions, we have to understand that there is an acid base character to them as well. And in this scenario, if I look at the reverse reaction, I can see that the bicarbonate ion is picking up a hydrogen from the hydronium to become a carbonic acid again. That means that this is acting as a base. And the hydronium in that case is acting as an acid. So this is what we refer to as a conjugate acid base pair. I've got a pair of substances that are different by 
one hydrogen ion from each other and one of them will act as an acid and the other one will act as a base in the same equation. So when we're making a buffer solution, what we would want to do is we would want to pair this conjugate, or excuse me, this weak acid, carbonic acid, with its conjugate base, bicarbonate, and make sure that both substances are present in the same solution in appreciable amounts at the same time. Now this particular system, the carbonic acid bicarbonate buffer system, this is the primary system that exists in your blood. Your blood maintains a pH of about 7.4. Where does that pH come from? Well, it comes from this combination of carbonic acid and bicarbonate ion together. Together, they kind of work in concert to help keep your blood pH right around 7.4. Now, how does it work? Well, if I have equal amounts of both present at the same time in my solution, what's interesting is that each of them are capable of reacting with varying amounts of acid or base that are introduced to the system. So take my carbonic acid, for example. If that carbonic acid is exposed to hydroxide ions, what happens is that the hydroxide ion acts as a base, steals one of those hydrogens, and becomes water. As it becomes water, it converts that carbonic acid into bicarbonate ion. So in the end, no new free hydroxide is present. All we've seen is a shift in the balance of power between the hydroxide, or excuse me, between the bicarbonate ion and the carbonic acid. That modest shift in power will impact pH, but to a much lesser degree. If I go from no free hydroxide to tons of free hydroxide, my pH goes from 7 to 12 in a matter of drops. But in a buffer system, I'd go from 7.4 to 7.6 on the pH scale. On the opposite end, Let's say that I add some hydronium, some, some acid. Well, the acid is going to act as an acid, give one of its hydrogens to the bicarbonate ion, and the bicarbonate ion is going to turn into carbonic acid as a result. We're going to see an increase in my carbonic acid concentration, a decrease in my bicarbonate concentration, but no net change in the concentration of H+. Which means, again, instead of seeing a big jump in pH going from pH 7 to pH 2, I'm seeing a modest change, pH 7.4 7 to 7.3. 7.3, 7.2, Those differences in the way that your body is able to regulate your pH using these buffer systems is the difference between you being able, being going from wild states of acidosis to alkalosis to acidosis to alkalosis based upon what you eat and drink and how you breathe and live 
to your body maintaining a really pretty close homeostatic state where you pretty much exist and keep going regardless of how you interact with your environment. Now, there's extreme cases. Your organs start to malfunction. You end up going into a state of acidosis. You intentionally go on the keto diet and try to use ketoacidosis as a method of losing weight. There are extreme circumstances that go along with those. But overall, your blood, your body, maintains a relatively consistent pH, regardless of in your environment, regardless of your diet, because of the buffer systems that exist inside of your blood, inside of your body. So what we need to do is we need to learn how to identify buffer systems based upon what is present. And so again, what we're looking for here are conjugate acid-base pairs. That is, those matched sets from those chemical reactions, but it has to be a match of a weak acid or a weak base and its partner. So in number one, hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide, would I be able to make a buffer system out of these two substances? If the answer is yes, I need to identify what the weak acid is and what the conjugate is. So first of all, do I have a weak acid in number one? Hydrochloric acid, is it a strong acid or a weak acid? It's a strong acid. As a strong acid, we can disqualify it as a buffer. Strong acids do not make buffers. You have to have that reversibility. You have to have that ability to go from the ions back to the molecule. Strong acids don't do that. So number one, it's out. In number two, CH3COOH, and sodium CH3COO. Um, this is better known as acetic acid. And sodium acetate. All right, do we have a potential buffer system here? Is acetic acid a weak acid? Yes, acetic acid is a weak acid. Does sodium acetate contain the conjugate of acetic acid. Does it contain the ion that if I took away the hydrogen would be left over? Yeah. This matches that. So I've got both present at the same time. This is a buffer. The buffer system that we would be looking at would be the 
be this one. And it is reversible because that acid is weak. All right, what about our last one? Hydrobromic acid and potassium bromide. Now in this case, we do have a conjugate pair. We've got HBr and Br as a conjugate pair. The bromide is the conjugate base of the hydrobromic acid. So we've got the second criteria met. We've got a conjugate pair. Is hydrobromic acid a weak acid? No, it's a strong acid as well. So it's out also. Yes, I mean. So what we need to look for is we need to look for a strong, or excuse me, we need to look for a weak acid or a weak base and the conjugate that goes with it. So if I gave you NH3 and NH4Cl, this would be a buffer as well, because what I would be able to recognize is here I've got a weak base, and here would be its conjugate acid, because they are different by that one H plus. So this works for bases as well. It's more commonly found with acids. Uh, it's more common to make it that way at least but it would work for bases as well. So if I had a weak base and I had its conjugate acid in a salt like that, I would be able to identify that as a buffer as well. And so this would also be a buffer. So that's what you're looking for. And so identifying those lists, conjugates, or excuse me, of, of weak acids, weak bases, and being able to identify by formula, you know, when that acid is missing the hydrogen for its conjugate base, when that base has a hydrogen added to it for its conjugate acid, those, those make a really big difference. All right, any other questions with buffers uh, before we kind of put this one away? So in lab, if you haven't done lab already, if you have lab this afternoon with me or tomorrow with Dr. Peralta, you are going to see buffers in action. I wanted to provide you a little bit of context for that before um, we go fully into that experiment so that you had a little bit better understanding of what it was that you were seeing. Now that we're there, now we can go back to where we were in talking about sections four and five here about solutions and pH. Now, as far as solutions and pH, this is stuff that, again, you saw last week in the lab. Um, we didn't talk a whole lot about what it was, but we, we can kind of fill in some of the gaps now. When it comes to acid and base, one of the ways that we quantify strength, perhaps a little bit wrongly, is based on pH. We can determine whether an acid or base is more dangerous, more um, uh, reactive, more potent, based upon where it sits on the pH scale. 
Now the pH of a solution is directly related to the concentration of H plus or hydronium in that solution. And so from a calculation standpoint, we can calculate pH using either of those numbers. The brackets here refer to the molarity concentration of that particular substance, whether it's the H plus concentration or the hydronium concentration, however your example problem wants to put it. Remember, hydronium and hydrogen ion are the same thing. They refer to the same exact concept. So some things about the pH scale. Again, this is how we calculate pH. That's an important thing to grab onto. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this on Friday. But in regards to the scale itself, the scale is a logarithmic scale that goes from zero to 14. Now, what do I mean when I say that this is a logarithmic scale? What that means is that each value on the scale differs from the one before it by a factor of 10. So if I'm looking at hydronium or hydrogen ion concentration at pH 5, I'm going to have a concentration of 10 to the negative fifth. At a pH of 4, I'm going to have a concentration of 10 to the negative fourth. So the difference between pH 4 and pH 5 is a tenfold difference in concentration. 10 to the fourth divided by 10 to the fifth is equal to 10. And so each mark on the scale is a factor of 10 greater or lesser in concentration than the other ones before or after it. So if I want to compare something like this, pH of 13 versus pH of 7, The difference between them is not 6, but rather 10 to the 6th, because we're talking about a factor of 10, another factor of 10, another factor of 10, another factor of 10. And these are all multiplied by each other, 10 to the 6th, which would be one million times. So pH seven is one million times more acidic than pH 13. Or if you'll look at it the other way, pH 13 is one million times more basic than pH seven. So with that in mind, Let's answer these two questions. Since this is a logarithmic scale, by what factor would we anticipate the hydrogen ion concentration to be differed if I go from eight to nine? I'm going a jump of one should be 10 to the first. And since I'm going from eight to nine, the 
hydronium concentration at nine is 10 times less than it was at eight. If I go from four to two, that's a difference of two. It should be 10 to the second or 100. However, since I'm going down the scale, I'm getting more acidic. The concentration is going to be 100 times more at pH 2 than it was at pH 4. So we're going to stop it right there for today. On Friday, we're going to kind of clean up and finish up chapter 13 here by diving into where this concept of pH comes from, from a conceptual standpoint. And then we'll get into some of the more detailed calculations regarding pH, pOH, and concentrations of those hydrogen and hydroxide ions. Uh, which you saw in last week's lab at the end. Have a good afternoon.